of Excellent Cultures is with us. Steve, I'm going to start off with this question. What are the two most misunderstood words in corporate America today? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, and they weren't always this way. But the two most min misunderstood words in corporate America today are culture and accountability. Um, believe it or not. Culture, because everybody talks about it. Uh, in every conversation with every leader I think I've ever had in my 38 years of helping businesses build great cultures, that word has always come up, but it means something different to everybody. And no one ever takes the time to Google it or uh, look it up in the dictionary to find out what we mean by business culture or organizational culture. So it, it runs the gambit from what kind of food do we eat in India versus Mexico, you know, to <laughs> what, do you, what do you do downtown, you know, doing downtown at the theater on Saturday night to uh, keggers and ping pong tables in the, you know, keggers on Friday night after work, ping pong tables in the break room and uh, free dress codes on Friday or any other day of the week. I got uh, a guess that culture means something different the way you're talking about oh, it, yeah. and that's what we're going to be talking about throughout the show. Oh, yeah. But what about accountability? Well, accountability uh, comes from our, our hierarchical leadership history before the millennial generation set us back on our rear ends and made us rethink what it takes to have an effective company. And in essence, the traditional mindset of accountability, whether it's a leader or whether it's an employee or a follower, we, we grew up with the perspective that what accountability means, and again, this is the below the surface definition, culture is always below the surface, is I'm the boss, here's your job description, it's my job to hold you accountable, now go do it. Now, from a uh, performance perspective or a motivational perspective, anyone that's ever studied psychology knows that restrictive motivation or motivation that has a strong have to associated with it, you know, generates resulting behaviors. You know, avoidance, uh, pushback, um, uh, head nodding and smiling, everything's great boss, but nothing ever gets done. Uh, and there's names for these in terms and ways to measure all of these. But in fact, just look at, at tax time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, are you ch chomping at the bit to go file your tax return only if you've got a big refund coming? But if you don't, or if you think you might need to pay, we always <laughs> wait till the last minute. Look at the post office lines, you know, you know, the night before <laughs> April 15th, because everybody waits till the last minute because we it's 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 not something, it's ha it's a have to, it's not a want to. Now that being the case, if I'm a leader and I'm leading people. Uh, who have in their minds, even though I might be the most empowering, equipping leader in the world, but in their minds, their belief is this guy's job is to thump me, to make sure that I do my job or I don't do my job, then the response that you get from that type of understanding is less than effective. Now, conversely, uh, studying all kinds of high performance teams, you know, in athlete, in sports, in the military, in business, the best example that we found historically, and it's been around for a long time, is the Blue Angel flight team. You know, years ago there was a, um, a Discovery Channel show. It's not even on Google anymore. It's that, it's that old. But they went inside the Blue Angels and they interviewed the entire team. The culture that they run on is a culture of service a service to each other, not customer service, but how can I help the guy on my left and my right improve, uh, and how can they help me improve, and how can we all work together to be able to serve our ultimate customer, whoever it is. And they've even boiled it down to a, how does one hold, what does accountability mean in a culture of service? In a culture of service, what accountability means is, I'll be accountable for that, you know, regardless of what my level of hierarchy is in the organization, please hold me accountable because I know by you doing that, it helps me improve and it helps the team improve. So uh, real accountability is not policing, it's free will, voluntary, people raising their hands saying we all want to win together, we all want to improve together, and therefore accountability is something we all need, so tell us what we don't see. Tell us how we can get better. <clears throat> wow, what a way to start the show. Yeah, pretty uh, amazing. So let's, so let's get to exactly what Excellent Cultures is, your company. Mm -hmm. Well, Excellent Cultures has been around for about 38 years in a, in a variety of different configurations mm -hmm. with the purpose of helping businesses and organizations create cultures that win. 
and it's it's really interesting because the winning has never changed. It's always been part of humanity and certainly the American dream. But uh, the way that you go about winning has changed drastically. Okay? How so? Well, a good friend of mine, um, uh, w one of our marketing experts, and I were chatting not long ago, and uh, in the course of the conversation, we talked about winning. And uh, what, he, what his insight was that if Vince Lombardi was alive today, uh, he would coach much more like Pete Carroll than like the traditional Vince Lombardi as an equipping, empowering coach as opposed to an authoritative go do this or else kind of a coach. And that the reason for that was because what Vince was committed to was not hierarchical coaching or, authorita or authoritative, I'm holding you accountable, now go do your job coaching. He was committed to winning. Uh, and in this day and time, folks don't respond to that old, you have to, I'm holding you accountable, authoritative figure anymore. I mean, just look at politics, look at the news. <laughs> Do I have uh, to? <laughs> no. <laughs> as little as possible. But it's so revealing when you look at human behavior and what really causes functionality and excellence and what brings about winning from a team perspective. Hmm. Let's uh, let's get to that definition of culture then that you okay. you, you promised us. Well, if you, you know, just Google organizational culture, and what you'll find is it's the shared beliefs, the mindsets, the habits, the attitudes that govern how people behave at work, and in in, in short, how we get things done. And how we get things done is not based upon the best practice. It's based upon whatever is in the minds and the belief system of the people. So you could have a culture where the dominant belief of the people is uh, we're supposed to sit around and be told what to do. And you could have an empowerment-oriented leader whose belief was, well, my job is to encourage and equip and empower folks. Guess what's going to happen? The leader is going to get very, very frustrated because he keeps trying, he, he's busy trying to empower and equip people who really believe that they're supposed to be told what to do and they're waiting for a command. They're waiting for a command or a shout from above and so they just sit there and smile and nod their head and tell the boss that everything's wonderful or, or the reverse. So you know? is the way you hire then in today's business culture, today being 2016, is, is it different today than what it was just five years oh, ago? Well, uh, absolutely. You know, the reason that it's different is because culture has shifted. Hierarchical cultures don't work like they used to, uh, except in maybe a, a few very significant, very highly specific, dangerous industries where they need a really smart expert to be able to give people to instructions. But those don't even work if you don't have the mind mindset of the followers being of the m mindset that, gosh, we really need to know what's right to do and, and then do it. Uh, it's about the collective mindsets of leaders and followers and the relationship that exists together, which is why Gallup has told us that, you know, gosh, guess what, in the last two years, uh, after preaching ad nauseum about how important engagement is, we improved a whopping half a percent from 70% to 69.5% disengaged. We still have 18% of people who tell the confidential survey that they hate their jobs. And the most common reason for hating their jobs is they hate their boss. Uh, Jim Clifton, who wrote the cover memo on the last Gallup um, instrument and results, mm -hmm. you know, called, called this new generation of managers, bosses that are hated, the managers from hell. Uh, and, and people don't really quit an organization, they quit a boss. And, uh, and the other thing that's so unique is the bosses, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, my goal is to be the manager from hell today. They don't know they are a manager from hell, nor do they know what they're doing to cause people to back up and do the opposite of what they ask. Uh, so it's just kind of a, a stuck cycle. So what's the difference between winning and losing in business today then? Well, um, you know, you, you have your traditional measurements, which are, uh, you know, profitability, you know, quality, uh, safety, uh, customer service or customer satisfaction. You know, in essence, anything that, that causes the business to grow, uh, prosper, and be sustainable for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, those, those are kind of the same. They've never yeah. changed. They've never changed. They're never going to change. But what has changed, just like in the analogy between 
the Vince Lombardi style of coaching and the Pete Carroll style of coaching, which changed is society and mindsets and generations and belief systems. And uh, they always will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll give you, I'll give you another big one. Uh, the millennial generation today is accused by many experts as being the narcissistic generation which I don't fully agree with, but when you look at the, the psychology and the sociology behind it, uh, we had a brilliant uh, pediatrician in the 50s who wrote a book uh, and told Dr. Benjamin Spock, best-selling book, I think it sold over 50 million copies, mm -hmm. you know, almost in an all-time bestseller, second only to the Bible. Yep. And, and what he told us was that our children were devoid in self-esteem and that they needed to grow their self-esteem. So for the next 50 years, Every educational training program, every uh, corporate training program, every personal development program has all been about building the self-esteem of the individual. Guess what? Uh, we've overdosed on self-esteem, and now we have a whole generation of me, 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 what's in it for me narcissists. They're telling us that technology with selfies and my YouTube channel and look at me, look at me, look at me, have actually you know worked against us. Now. Uh, many would tell you that because millennials are the victims of this technology burst and being raised by parents who overdose them on self-esteem unknowingly uh, are really stuck, but I find it's just the opposite. I think if, if you know how to communicate and work with millennials, they're our future because if you study the research even further, what really engages millennials more than themselves is their purpose and you help a millennial or a team of millennials get aligned with their purpose, something that resonates and increases effectively what they can do and help them be part of a team that is serving a greater cause and being functional, uh, you've got the, the most pot potentially most productive group of, of, of generational people on the planet. Well, let's talk about changes that are that are happening. And, sure. Uh, we talked before the show about Microsoft, yeah. and you talked about the changes that are happening there, and it really reflects just what you're saying. Yeah, so the Microsoft's great organization. We've had the opportunity to serve them in a number of applications over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, just had one of their... They may, be, um, they, they may be great, but they did have this reputation where their innovation was seemed to be lacking. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we just had one of their uh, executives uh, attend one of our workshops who... The first one he came to was 25 years ago. Now he's long since retired, and his comments were, uh, same timeless principles, they always work when you apply them properly. Okay, uh, so Microsoft originally was a tech company that was basically built on the best product. You know, nobody could compete with Windows, and even in the court system, you know, Bill Gates won won the case mm -hmm. uh, to be able to have a monopoly, you know, on his yes, operating system, and it was amazing. Uh, yet, as as time went on and the company grew, and now we've got all these divisions, which are you know Xbox, and uh, I was talking to the other day one of one of the leaders of the Minecraft division, which is an acquisition, uh, and it's become so broad and so diverse. All still about tech, but some hardware, some software, some applications. Uh, you name it. The new CEO, Satya Nadella, is all about building the culture of team. And what did evolve as a highly competitive, silo-driven organization, now under Nadella's leadership, is moving in a direction of, of collectivity and service and team, and uh, very much because that's the way you win in 2016. That's the way you win in this millennium. And so that is what the millennials are. The millennials uh, work better as teams. Uh, much better. They work better as a team than they do as an individual because they gravitate towards teams rather than individuality, even though uh, selfies are such an important part of how they communicate. Uh, and uh, th at the real core of, the, of all the research, it's m to a millennial, it's m m finding their purpose and being aligned in their purpose and hanging in there with their purpose and working toward their purpose is the most passionate driver in their life. And they would much rather be part of a purpose that aligns with who they are than they would get paid more money, better benefits. I mean, how's that for a switch for the hmm. over the last 20 years? You know, that makes so much sense considering the fact that I've had uh, so many different business leaders from around the world come and say that business is the driver of social change. Hmm. Uh, are millennials... <coughs> 
more responsible, if you will, towards society? Well, I, I would answer that question a little differently. What I would say is, yeah, business is the driver of social change, but people are the driver of business. Uh, <coughs> and, it, you know, it's all about the people, and if you want to go deeper, it's all about the belief systems of the people. And, you know, what do they believe about what's going to be most effective? What do they believe that's going to be ineffective? Uh, is what they believe consistent with the mission and vision of the organization? Uh, is it aligned? Do we believe that, that uh, we just, you know, w we don't like this job, but we want to keep it because it's a good source of income, so we nod our head and smile and give thumbs up to the boss all the time, but deep down inside we hate what we do and can hardly wait to get home and go do what we really love to do, which again is another trend. I mean, unprecedented number of small business startups who are folks that used to be employees and figured out a way to contract, you know, contract with their former employer to, you know, deliver products and service better. So is hiring different today? Oh, very much so. How so? Well, um, uh, if you look at, you talk to hiring managers, they're all about, you know, looking for and finding the best talent for sure and that hasn't changed much uh, yet uh, it's not just the best talent but how effectively can that talent perform on our team how do they fit with our culture you look at companies like Zappos who you know are known you know for building a great culture uh, but they built that from the startup. You know, their founder had in his mind, in his heart, a, the vision of the values that, that they wanted to build this culture on, and they were consistent and well-researched and thought out, so they hired people who held those same values. Now, you, you take, you know, a General Motors or a, or a Ford or a Toyota or uh, even a micro, Microsoft, who's been around for a few years, uh, that can't start over, or they could if they wanted to, but it doesn't make economic sense, and hire people that have your values. Or let's just say, if you did hire people that had your values 20 years ago, values of what gets, gets things done more effectively and wins today are different than they were you know, even five years ago. And it keeps changing. So big teams are essentially divided up now, and big companies are divided up in the little teams. Mm -hmm. So is it like a bunch of small businesses? Well, all working in some together? cases, it depends on the organization. I mean, the, the, common, the, the common scenario, you know, the two common driving factors of what really makes high-performance companies work well today uh, is uh, co collaboration, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, collaboration, you know, is, is just critical. So it's, it's about collaboration, but it's also about innovation. So uh, who can think of the next best product or system or process or way to solve a problem faster than anybody else? And all you have to do is go on Netflix and watch Apollo 13, the movie, again, to get a, v a view of what human innovation is really like. You know, in that scenario, it was do or die. Yeah. You know, it was do or die, and the leader, although he was a very forceful leader, and in that case that was necessary, basically said, too bad, it's your job to put a square peg in a round hole or a round peg in a square hole. And thanks to duct tape and an innovative mindset, innovative culture, if you will, they collaborated, they figured it out and saved the lives of the astronauts. And it's, you know, and it's been a benchmark story forever. But it tells us something about human behavior. And especially, I mean, with technology, everything keeps going faster and bigger and faster and bigger and faster and bigger. But the downside of that is with the, the, the largest enemies of great culture, largest enemies are speed and growth. And the, fast, you know, the faster you grow and the more people that you add, uh, the more human beings have a tendency to stop doing what made them successful in the first place. And when we're so busy running on the treadmill of getting the job done that we stop doing what made us successful in the first place, it's only a matter of time before Enron erupts. In fact, I had the opportunity not long ago to visit with Dr. Al Arisman, who's a well-known you know, author, former uh, head of research for the Boeing Company, uh, mm -hmm. now a noted professor, and has interviewed like a, a hundred you know, senior executives from the biggest companies on the planet. And what Al told me about his interview with the executive who was the whistleblower at Enron about their culture is what she told him was that the thing that they never wanted to hear was bad news. Don't give us any bad news. Uh, oh my now, gosh. Now, now, if you can imagine that, if, if and now, now the culture, you know, the organizational mindset becomes, we don't want to hear bad news. How can you correct if you never hear the bad news? Uh, how can you do anything but stay in a silo and tell yourself how great you are over and over again if you never hear the bad news? 
yet, uh, and, and according to Dr. Erisman and to the um, executive he interviewed, that was that was that company's demise because they didn't. And, and again, culture is always sneaky. It's below the surface. You never know when it's going to hit you, uh, but it's always there. That's why it's critical to always be paying attention to what's really going on, what people say on the confidential surveys, not just to the boss, and what they say about the deeper things, not just engagement, but effectiveness. What's driving their effectiveness? Because uh, you can, as we said earlier, you can have a happy, engaged, kumbaya, everybody hugging each other culture and go out of business, especially today when everything's moving as fast as it is. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if your competitor thinks of something faster than you did, you could be gone in the blink of an eye. You talk about innovators before, and the stereotypical innovator is someone who sits by himself and thinks up stuff and then just goes and does it. Is, uh, the stereotypical innovator is not somebody that's necessarily team-oriented. Well, Can that person exist in today's well, world? It, what you just described is a high-performance research scientist, and you know, and, and or an inventor, yeah. you know, who are who are very innovative. But uh, in today, again, we said it's no longer about the high-performance individual or the talented individual; it's the talented team. And uh, you know you can look probably the best sport. We've seen all this always in team sports. Probably the best sport to look at that's team is basketball, because you have specialists who are like you know specialization of labor. You know mm -hmm. nobody can bring the ball down court better than the point guard. Nobody can get the rebounds better than the big post guy. Um, so uh, you know no one can. You know, and every team has a three point you know three point shooter. The, the player would touch. It's about the, the the collaboration of how those different talent, differently talented folks, mesh together to be able to not just recognize but honor and celebrate the differences and the uniqueness and the talents of the others who don't have the same talents and gifts that they do. There's a tremendous speech, it's actually it's on a TED talk given by a former British ambassador who talks about the global power shift. And what he's talking about is the, the difference in the way people behave today, but particularly the power of networking. Uh, that seems to be the same thing as collaboration, the same thing, well, it's millennials driving networking. Yeah. That enables them to work with people around the world. Yeah. Is that what's happening in well, business? Very, very much so, especially when you have, you know, with, with what's happened with, with competition in the global economy and, you know, uh, uh, trade outside national borders like it is, uh, and you've got, you know, teams in Seattle working with uh, a sub team in New York and somebody in India and somebody in China, and they're all online at the hour that crosses where they all happen to be awake and not <laughs> asleep. And some are staying up, you know, late, and some are getting up early. And it's about working together to to collaborate and build, you know, serve customers better, build a better mousetrap, innovate in a way that your competition hasn't thought of yet, and do it for the lowest possible price. Uh, and be able to deliver the highest possible value, you know, to the customer because that's who that's who wins. Yeah. Now, with that being the case, uh, you know, both collaboration and innovation are critical. And the cool thing about when you put collaboration and innovation together and get them working well, then synergy happens. And synergy is the old one mule can pull ten thousand pounds in a wagon. Uh, two don't pull 20, they can pull 100,000 pounds. Uh, and I'm not sure if the numbers are right, but the principle is. And any scientist, any uh, physicist can tell you that that's true physically in science, but it's also true mentally and emotionally. Uh, you know, you see it every year in, in the playoffs of all of the team sports. You know, it's the team that not doesn't necessarily have the most well, talented individual. You know, LeBron James, most talented individual, but the team didn't win because they got outpaced by another team, at least in that season. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's no longer the most talented individual. It's the best team. And uh, if we can get both the best team and the most talented individuals, both, uh, that's great. But sometimes highly talented individuals are terrible team players. Yeah, uh, you know, if they're if they're egotistical and egocentric and uh, narcissistic, and it's all about me, forget about the team. Yeah, uh, we've talked about a, the, essentially a business cultural revolution that is happening. We had a cultural revolution here in in the United States in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Did is there anything from that that we're seeing in our business cultural oh, revolution? What I describe is is you know we talked about 
uh, what we learned from Dr. Benjamin Spock and remembered for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's what we learned from JFK and forgot because JFK told us in the 60s, you know, to, you know, ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you could do for your country. And if you follow his family history, his mom was the matron of service. And, uh, and was all about the value of service. And today, you're, you know, you, you look at just the, the high performance teams in sports who are very visible and you listen to the interviews after the game, it's about a culture of service. You know, uh, how am I serving the guy on my right and helping him succeed? How am I serving the guy or gal on my left and helping her succeed? Well, the Blue Angels might other? even be better than a sports uh, metaphor oh, oh, because, yeah. oh my oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, well, m millennials socialize. Uh, they socialize well and they know how to socialize through technology. Yet, when you bring that up, there's still one other factor that, again, we're finding that is just critical. What we hear from leaders time and time and time again is, you know, they love the content because it's all about facilitating change and making it work and team and organizational effectiveness, you know, 4.89 on a scale of five on the evaluations. But what they get the most out of in the process is not the content. It's the table discussions. You know, it's the conversations with other leaders like them relating face to face about how do we apply this principle? How do we solve this problem? How has it worked with my team? How has it worked in my life? Human beings are, we're, we're, we're so technology oriented, we've missed the value of face to face interactive human communication. And we're starving for it. I mean, everybody is. Every business person who's listening to this interview can identify with the fact of when they, sent 30 or 40 or 50 emails back and forth and never solved the problem and it could have been solved probably with one five-minute conference call where everybody is on the phone together interacting or a video call or better, better yet a face-to-face -face meeting. I mean you look at communication uh, you know and the statistics that drive communication the reason that we're so ineffective today compared to in that area where we were much better historically is because uh, words are only 10% oh, only effective in communicating. Uh, tone of voice and body language uh, make up the rest of that communication. So words are 10% effective, body language is 70%, you know, tone of voice is the less, you know, the, the rest. Or I could say, you know, even to our viewers, uh, stay there, uh, you know, uh, come here. And my gesture, you know, come here. <laughs> my gesture says stay there. Uh, they get the stay there when it's aligned with the gesture, but it gets you confused. So your tendency is to follow the nonverbal. Now take that, take that to the next step. Our lives are spent emailing, texting, posting. And you know what? We want people to, to be spending time watching this show because we've come to the end of the show. Steve, I want to make sure that we get your website up. Um, man, fantastic information. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. Excellentcultures.com. Make sure you listen to the podcast, Excellent Cultures slash podcast, because we have interviews with a good hundred of the best leaders on the planet who are really making this happen that uh, is there for anyone who wants to listen and study to capture everything you can and take it to the next level.